heartburn and treatment options. After the presentation, uh, you can always chat your questions. Uh, my name is Amy Pont, and I'm Director of Community Programs for Community Care Plan, or CCP. CCP is the health plan with a heart. We're owned by Broward Health and Memorial Healthcare System, serving 100,000 members in Florida Healthy Kids, Medicaid, commercial, self-insured employee health plans, and sponsored programs. Our health plans cover a wide range of local medical services, offering an excellent choice of physician and benefits that help me members get and stay healthy. Community Care Plan's mission is to build healthier communities. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Brett Cohen. As the Chief of Adult General Surgery and Bariatric Program at Memorial Healthcare Systems, Dr. Brett Cohen is a board certified general surgeon who specializes in minim minimally invasive surgeries and bariatric procedures for surgical weight loss. He earned his medical degree at the University of Miami School of Medicine in 1997 and completed his residencies at Emory University Hospital in 1999 and at University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital in 2003. He completed his fellowship in advanced laparoscopic surgery at the University of Southern California in 2004. Dr. Cohen specializes in hernias, anti-reflux surgeries, the sleeve gastrectomy, and the Lynx procedure. Please help me welcome Dr. Cohen. It's very nice. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all tonight about um, about reflux, it's a, uh, a very, very significant problem and one that's very, very prevalent and one that we do have some good options for. And so uh, that's really why we're here tonight to learn a little bit about what this disease process is and, and what we can do about it. So uh, I appreciate that, uh, that introduction and we'll go ahead and get started. So we titled the talk, What's Burning You Up? Heartburn and Treatment. And um, when we talk about heartburn, people talk about acid reflux, acid in the esophagus, or just plain heartburn. It goes by uh, by a bunch of different names. Um, let's see. So, um, you know, as we give a, a few examples here, people come into the office, come to their physicians, talking about it's just a little touch of heartburn, but really they talk about this fire that's in their chest. Talk about this burning that constantly uh, irritates them and can't get worse at various times, whether it's with meals or or late in the evening. And uh, it oftentimes can feel like your chest or your esophagus is just on fire. And so it can be relatively significant. When we talk about reflux disease, we kind of ask ourselves, well, what is gastroesophageal reflux disease? It can present in, in, in many different ways. And it's not always the very classic burning in the chest. But when we talk about reflux, these are our very classic, what we call GI or gastrointestinal type symptoms. It's that heartburn. It's that burning, that warm feeling in the chest or that feeling that my chest is on fire. We talk about regurgitation, the feeling that things are constantly coming up. And when it's acid, it's oftentimes burning as it starts in the, in the lower chest and moves its way up towards the throat. It can show itself as, as a sour or a bitter taste in the back of your mouth. Some people describe that they almost feel like they're chewing on pennies and they get that funny taste in the back of their mouth. Uh, it's oftentimes after eating certain meals or larger meals, and then certainly after eating something and then lying down shortly thereafter, you may get some of that regurgitation. Water brash is that hot sensation, that just warmness in the chest or in the stomach. And it causes just sometimes a reflexive cough or often, oftentimes excessive salivation. And again, that's what we refer to when we talk about water brash. Dysphagia is difficulty with swallowing and the odynophagia is painful swallowing, both of which oftentimes go, go along with, with reflux disease. As the esophagus gets irritated, sometimes it's difficult to have that motion of the esophagus pushing things through and people feel like things are getting stuck. And oftentimes it actually hurts as foods go down and that painful swallowing that goes with it. Well, there are a lot of other areas that get affected by reflux disease and patients come in complaining of, of different things. So we'll oftentimes see patients come from their pulmonologists, their lung doctors, because as the acid comes all the way up into the throat, there's two holes in the back of the throat, one going down to the stomach, but the other one goes to the lungs. And as acid comes all the way up, oftentimes it can slip into the lungs and cause pneumonias and bronchitis. <clears throat> we know that almost as much as 30% of adults that present with new onset asthma is actually reflux disease and not, not really lung disease. It's that reactive spasm in the chest related to the acid that's making its way into the esophagus. We oftentimes get patients coming from their ENT doctors. They get hoarseness in their throat. They can get laryngitis or loss of their voice, this chronic cough, 
frequent swallowing, clearing their throat late at night. And so they present to their ENT thinking that this is something to do with uh, post-nasal drip or, <clears throat> or ENT issues, when in reality, it's acid coming up from the stomach. Uh, patients can present with chest pain, uh, uh, palpitations or rapid heart rates, because as the esophagus goes through the chest, it sits right behind the heart. And that acid coming into the esophagus can sometimes irritate the heart and cause cardiac type symptoms. As the acid makes its way all the way up and into the mouth, you can get irritation in the mouth and you can get uh, uh, dental erosions, you get cavities and dental caries. People talk about a foul taste in their mouth and having bad breath. So this can affect many, many different areas, not just um, um, uh, the classic GI type symptoms. There we go. So these are just some of the numbers that we talk about in terms of reflux disease and how it affects our population. We say that as many as 20% of adults will suffer from gastroesophageal reflux disease on a regular basis. That amounts to probably as many as 65 million Americans. So this is a very, very prevalent thing. And it spans all the way from people talking about just a little touch of heartburn to, you know, I get this burning all day long every day. You have about another 10 to 20% of patients that have symptoms that are self-treated. They just kind of go to the store and get some over-the-counter Tums. And now a lot of the, the, the acid suppression medications are over-the-counter. And so, you know, we're talking about somewhere between 30 to 40% of Americans that will have some degree of heartburn or reflux. It does tend to become a little more prevalent as we get older. There is a, a, a muscle, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit. There's a muscle at the very bottom of the esophagus that naturally is closed and it presents, prevents acid from coming into the esophagus. As we get a little older, that muscle doesn't tend to work as well and reflux can be a little more prevalent. It accounts for a significant, significant expenditure in our healthcare dollars. Um, as many as 9 million outpatient visits to gastroenterologists and other healthcare professionals for reflux disease accounting for as much as $24 billion a year uh, in that area. So it's a very, very significant uh, a disease process. Uh, most of the time, patients are presenting to their primary care physicians, oftentimes referred to gastroenterologists, and circle through the healthcare system like that. And it can have a lot of long-term effects. As it affects the esophagus, we can deal with things like gastritis, sorry, esophagitis, which is irritation in the esophagus. The esophagus can narrow down in stricture, causing, again, difficulties with swallowing. Barrett's esophagus is that chronic exposure to acid, and it changes the cells in the esophagus and it's one of our biggest precursors towards esophageal cancer. And so this is a very significant issue that we deal with and that we take very, very seriously. There are medical treatments for reflux disease and it's become much better over time. Um, when proton pump inhibitors, one of these classes of medications first came out, it really changed the face of reflux disease. We do know, however, that as many as 25 to as, uh, as much as 40% of patients won't respond to initial treatment with proton pump inhibitors. And proton pump inhibitors are the common medications we think of. This is your Nexium, the Protonix, Asifex, Dexalant, uh, all those classes of medications, which do a phenomenal job of controlling reflux disease, but there are as many as 25 up to 40% of patients that won't respond the way that we want them to. And oftentimes in patients that do respond when they get put on these medications chronically, we tend to find that the effectiveness of these medications wears off over time. And when you, when you look at what these medications are and what the drug companies have called them, they call them anti-reflux medications, when in reality, these medications do absolutely nothing for reflux. What they do is they neutralize the acid in the stomach. And so in someone that does have bad reflux and we define reflux as a location problem, it's not that someone is producing too much acid. It's the acid that's in the stomach is making its way into the esophagus at an abnormal amount. And these medications don't prevent that regurgitation. What they do is neutralize the acid, but things can still come into the esophagus and those non-acidic materials can still cause the same irritation. And so now we look for other methods of helping that doesn't just band-aid the situation and, and, and neutralize the acid. There were various polls that were done. Uh, uh, this one done back as far back as 2014, 2015, uh, polling people that are on proton pump inhibitors and saying, 
you know, what are your symptoms even while on the medications? And we see that as many as 80% of patients still have nighttime symptoms. So while they may not have a lot of that burning, they still feel that regurgitation coming up. They feel that their symptoms uh, are worse at night than it is during the day. They do have some symptoms during the day and function is affected. They have difficulties falling asleep. And as many as 45% of patients feel that medications do not relieve all of their symptoms. And so when you poll people in general, they'll tell you that as many as 40, up to 40% of patients feel that proton pump inhibitors, one of our strongest medications for reflux, just does not satisfy their problems. So we start to alter our lifestyle. The pillows start to grow in the bed and lying on more and more pillows and ultimately some, some books underneath your, your mattress and suddenly we're sleeping in an upright chair because the moment you lie down, the acid is coming up and it's becoming a big problem. So we need to find better ways to deal with this. So our goals for therapy here are to help people get off their medications, go back to normal living and have no more pain associated with their reflux disease. And that's really what surgery is about. So a little bit of kind of description about what we're trying to do with the operations that we offer for reflux disease. On the left here, we see a picture of the normal anatomy. You can see in the stomach, there's that portion that is closed. That's that lower esophageal sphincter. And so acid and things that are in the stomach can't make their way into the esophagus. When we look at what's abnormal, the picture over here on the left, sorry, on the screen's right, so I can get this to play. You can see as acid comes in, it gets kept into the stomach and that valve closes. It doesn't allow things to regurgitate back into the esophagus. When we look at an abnormal, a dysfunctional sphincter, that sphincter stays open, things come in, and because it does not close, it allows the acid to pass back up into the esophagus. And that's where the inherent problem is with people that have significant gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now this muscle, this lower esophageal sphincter is designed to be within the abdominal cavity. And there's an entity called a hiatal hernia where that stomach or portion of that stomach is pushed up above the diaphragm and that muscle is now up in the chest and that'll cause that muscle not to work very well. And that can make this situation worse. And so here are some of the pre uh, precipitating factors for reflux disease. We know that people, when they overeat, when you overeat, you distend the stomach and you pull open that muscle, allowing things to regurgitate. If the muscle's not working very well and you lie down shortly after fin uh, filling your stomach, you lose the effect of gravity. And again, things can regurgitate their way back up. Obesity or being overweight is a significant risk factor for reflux disease because it increases pressure in the belly. That pressure pushes on the stomach and pushes things up. So helping people lose weight is a significant uh, impact and help in terms of controlling reflux disease. There are certain things that will lower the pressure in that lower esophageal sphincter. And so we work on those medical management, things like uh, caffeine, greasy fatty foods, uh, chocolates, things like that will lower the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter and predispose people to reflux. And again, carbonated beverages will tend to distend the stomach and pull open that valve and allow things to reflux back up. So these are a lot of the things that contribute to the problem along with the dysfunctional anatomy. Again, proton pump inhibitors don't do a whole lot to prevent reflux. What they do is they neutralize the acid, but we have an entity of what we call NERD or non-erosive reflux disease, non-acidic reflux disease, because it's no longer acidic, but it still regurgitates into the esophagus. And it can still cause a lot of the same problems that we see in the esophagus that acid reflux causes. But what are some of the long-term implications? We talk about reflux and we know that it hurts, we know that it burns, we know that it doesn't feel good, but what are some of the real significant impacts down the road? Well, we know that with long-term medications like proton pump inhibitors, we learned that some of these medications have side effects. They interfere with the ability to absorb calcium. And so risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia is one of the long-term risks for taking these medications long-term. Constant exposure of acid and this regurgitant in the esophagus predisposes people to that entity we call Barrett's esophagus, which is the predisposition for esophageal cancer. It is our number one risk factor for esophageal cancer. And so we wanna block that, that material of that acid, that regurgitant from coming into the esophagus. Uh, there are drug reactions related to these medications. They interfere with the function of various other medications. And the simple fact that patients don't wanna be on medications for the rest of their lives. 
They want a long-term solution that's going to get them off medications. A lot of patients feel that when they come off their medicines, they have significant worsening of their symptoms and they become reliant on it, looking for a better option, uh, something that will prevent the reflux and yet not require medication. And so we say reflux kind of lives on the spectrum. If we look all the way on the left side of the screen, there's very mild gastroesophageal reflux disease. These are your patients that talk about taking a Tums here or there, or they get some over-the-counter medication and they do just fine. And all the way on the right side of the screen are patients that are on medications twice a day, high dose medications, and yet still have terrible symptoms and terrible what we call end organ damage, disease in the esophagus. And most people live somewhere within that spectrum, whether you're on medications, you're breaking through with symptoms, you have some changes in the esophagus, or you're very well controlled. Most people are living somewhere on that spectrum. When we talk about surgery, we talk about patients that are a little bit on the right side of the screen. They're on medications, they can't get off their medications, they're having additional symptoms, or they're starting to feel or suffer from some of those end organ issues that we talk about. But what are the, uh, the options? When we talk about surgery, we look for patients that we think will be very classic and have very classic response and do well with surgery. And so there are three things that we typically look for. We look for patients that have very classic symptoms. So a lot of those GI type symptoms, the midivagastric burning, the regurgitation, the heartburn, the water brash, that's the very classic type symptoms that people talk about. And we know those symptoms classically get better with surgery. Um, we, we like to see people respond to medical therapy. So while you might not completely get off your medications, while you might not completely be resolved of your symptoms, and while you may have had a good period where you were responding to medical therapy and now you're not responding, that response to medicines tells us that this is most likely reflux disease, and that's a good sign for us. And then we'd like to see subjective evidence as well as objective evidence of the disease. So you complain of reflux, you complain of heartburn, those are subjective symptoms. We also like to see objective evidence. When we go down with a scope, there's evidence of irritation in the esophagus, esophagitis. A Shatsky's ring is an irritative ring that forms because of the reflux, and it's usually only seen in reflux disease. If we do a pH study that measures how much acid is coming up, that's positive for acid reflux. So we have good complaints, and we have proof that there's really reflux in the esophagus. We have a response to medical therapy. Again, signs that it is truly reflux, and again, classic symptoms. With those three things, we know that there's a greater than 90 to 95% chance that patients will respond to surgical therapy, come off their medications long-term, and not need medical treatment. Other candidates for surgery are people that have abnormal anatomy, so they have high hernia. Some of that stomach is pushed up into the chest, and it's causing a lot of those symptoms. And again, we look for that pH study and a manometry study is a study that looks for the function of the esophagus. We wanna know that the esophagus is functioning properly before we go and operate on it. So our very, very classic operation for reflux disease is called a fundoplication. And this operation was actually described by a guy named Dr. Nissen. And so it carries his name as a Nissen fundoplication. And again, the idea being that reflux is based on the concept that that lower esophageal sphincter is just not functioning very well. It's not closing and it's allowing acid into the esophagus. Well, this operation takes a portion of the stomach and wraps it around that muscle to create a little bit better tone. And so essentially what it does is it closes the muscle down and actively blocks the acid from coming up. So if you look at the picture all the way on the right side of the screen, you see the wrapped portion of the stomach around the bottom of the esophagus that's closing it down and actually blocking the acid from coming up. And this operation works phenomenally well. People wake up after surgery and boom, they'll tell you it's gone. It feels better because you have physically blocked the acid from coming up. We do most of these surgeries laparoscopically, which means we do them through a group of tiny incisions. It's four or five small incisions on the belly wall. Most people stay in the hospital just one night, go home the next day. I take patients off their medications the day after their operation, because again, we block the acid. There's no more reflux and medications are not needed at that point. There's a very, very small chance that the hernia or the reflux may come back, and that's about 5% of the time. So again, about 95% of people are essentially cured of their reflux long-term without need for medication. So again, these operations work exceptionally well, and we talk a little bit about what the indications for surgery are and, and, and who we think will respond well to it. This is a little cartoon caricature of a, uh, a, a fundoplication. This is a description of when it's done through an open operation, which we really don't do anymore, but it's a little bit easier to see. 
as we go into the belly, we free up that portion of the stomach and we wrap it around the esophagus, creating that fundoplication so that acid is now physically blocked in the, in the stomach and can't make its way into the esophagus. Again, some of the old time stuff, we don't do open surgery like that uh, much at all anymore. More of what we do is laparoscopic, which this again is a little picture of how we do these things laparoscopically. That's a group of very small incisions. We blow the belly up with some gas. We pass a, a camera into the belly. And with our instruments, we perform the exact same operation of wrapping some of the stomach around the esophagus to block that muscle and prevent things from making their way into the esophagus. This is a little bit of numbers and the data that we look at. And again, it goes back to speaking to about 90 to 95% of patients will report significant improvement of their reflux, if not complete resolution. And we go by what we call quality of life scores. And we see that these are dramatically improved uh, with these anal reflux operations. 97% of patients found that they were cured at three months and that persisted in as many as 90% of patients at five years and about 82 to 85% of patients at 10 years. And so these operations work exceptionally well and they are very, very durable, long lasting operations. And this is some of the data from the initial experience. We've gotten better at doing these operations and I think our results are exceeding these papers at this point. Well, there's been a lot of talk about how to do these procedures and can we do them endoscopically? So we don't even need to make incisions on the belly wall. What if we do them through a scope that goes down the esophagus and prevents an operation? And there are two of these procedures that are still out there in the market. A TIF or a transoral incisionless fundoplication also goes by esophix and then the streta procedure. Uh, unfortunately, most of the data uh, for these procedures will support the fact that they have a relatively high failure rate at the onset, and over time, they continue to show a, 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 a fall off rate. So when we look at TIF or transoral incisionless fundoplication, one of the biggest issues we listed here is that within the first six months, you'll have only about 40% of patients maintaining improvement. So by one year, you have about a 60% failure rate. And so that's a very, very high number in a short period of time. And so these, op these procedures are becoming less and less uh, offered because when we have other procedures like fundoplication and the Lynx procedure, which are greater than 90% effective long term, and you have a procedure like this that is failing as many as 60% within a year, these aren't that commonly done anymore. Strata has some of the similar data where we, uh, the Strata procedure is a device where they uh, 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 expose a radio frequency energy to the lower esophageal sphincter to create some scarring, which makes it a little bit tighter. Again, showing that. As, as many as 45 to 50% of these patients will get relief, showing as many as 65 to, sorry, 55 to 60% of patients won't get relief from these uh, endoscopic procedures. So unfortunately, we just don't have a very good way of dealing with this endoscopically at this time. But there is a, a, another option other than fundoplication, an option that's a little less invasive where we don't alter the anatomy of the stomach. And it does involve um, um, a foreign body. A lynx is a ring of magnetic beads. Um, the lynx was uh, uh, first approved in the United States in 2012. So we're now coming up on almost 10 years worth of experience with this device. It also goes by a magnetic sphincter augmentation device. And the idea is we slip this ring of magnetic beads around the esophagus right at the bottom where that little muscle is. And what it does is when it's closed, it provides a little additional tone to that muscle to help prevent reflux from coming into the esophagus. And when you swallow, food goes through, it opens up the magnets and allows food in and then afterwards closes right back down. And so these were some of the initial papers looking at success with um, um, the magnetic sphincter augmentation device. And the FDA approval required only 55 to 60% improvement with a device. And what the initial trials showed is up to 65% resolution of acid exposure uh, with the device. However, when we looked at the long-term papers and the more extensive experience with this, we see as much as a 93% resolution or uh, um, um, resolution of acid exposure in the esophagus long-term. Further studies looking at quality of life again showed almost a 98% resolution of symptoms, patients off medication, um, and uh, a quality of life score is improving from uh, 27 up to a 50 over the course of that short period of time. And so again, we're seeing significant improvement, almost equivalent to uh, a NIS and fundoplication with a de this device. 
And this is a little bit about what a lynx looks like. It's a ring of magnetic beads. Again, when the beads are engaged, the acid is blocked in the stomach. When the beads are open, it's allowing food through. This is the concept of how it works. It sits right at the top here of the stomach or the bottom of the esophagus, right around the lower esophageal sphincter. And when the beads are engaged, the acid is kept in the stomach. When food goes through, the beads open to allow food in, and then they reclose thereafter. Again, a little bit more of a picturesque uh, idea. The idea of the lynx is that it's based on the gastric pressure. The pressure in the stomach is about five to 10 millimeters of mercury pressure. The pressure that the device provides is a little higher than that, up to 15 to 18, sometimes up to 20 millimeters of mercury pressure. And so that overcomes the pressure of the stomach. And yet the esophagus, when it's squeezing and pushing food down, the pressures in the esophagus are significantly higher than links. So it allows food to pass through. It's not gonna block the food from coming through. There were studies looking at links, comparing it to um, fund application, asking us which is a better operation to provide for our patients. And there are a couple of symptoms that go along with fund application initially afterwards, because we're wrapping portion of the stomach, patients feel that they fill up very quickly. They get early satiety, they tend to eat a little less and will lose a little bit of weight. They tend to have a little bit of gas bloating because the gas that goes in can't come back up initially and that goes away with a little bit of time. And so some of those symptoms tended to be a little bit more prevalent with the fund application than it was with the Lynx device. But aside from that, when we look at how effective they are at getting patients off of their medications and resolving symptoms, we see that it's close to 90% for both devices long-term. Fund application and Lynx tend to be very, very equivalent and they do a phenomenal job. So a couple of the conclusions, reflux is a very, very significant issue. Uh, it has sounding effects throughout the medical field, but as well as in patients' personal lives and the way that they go through their days. There are medical treatments. Medical treatments can be effective and they can be appropriate for certain patients, but there is a population of patients that need to go that next step and look for other definitive treatment. Uh, patients are sometimes nervous to go through with an operation. Sometimes physicians and gastroenterologists are anxious to refer patients for surgery for these things. And, and, and my response is don't be afraid. We have good options. We have good safe options. These operations are very, very safe and they work exceptionally well. Endoscopic treatments are not up to par at this point. And so between a fund application and a Lynx procedure, these are really our gold standard surgical treatment for reflux disease. And they add an additional option. They work exceptionally well. They help patients come off their medications, resolve their symptoms and do exceptionally well with it. So we've done well, we have very good experience with this and we're more than happy to help take care of anybody that's looking for some assistance with their reflux disease. So I think that concludes everything I have to say tonight. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you all about uh, reflux, about heartburn. I hope we've given you some good insight on some of the options that we have and some of the treatments that are out there. And if anybody's interested in talking a little bit more about it, I'm more than happy to see anybody and help with it. Thank um, you so I'll put up here a little bit about my contact information for you. Um, Certainly welcome to a, a schedule appointment in the office. We do do appointments online. You can go through mhs.net to find me online to schedule an appointment. The phone number for the office is there and we're certainly happy to see anybody and make, uh, make ourselves available to you. So again, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'm certainly happy to entertain any questions that anybody has. So oh, Dr. Cohn, thank you so much. There was a lot of really great information and a lot of stuff I wasn't aware of. Um, I do have one question actually. So do you recommend uh, if you have a patient who has a significant heartburn who maybe hasn't been treating it uh, at all other than Tums to be evaluated first of all for any esophageal disease, uh, you know, just in general before, you know, before doing, entertaining any other treatments? So the, that's a really good question. And, and like I said at the beginning, you know, you have as many as 10 to 20 percent of Americans that are out there self-treating their reflux because right. these medications are now over the counter. They're easy to get a hold of. Reflux is very prevalent. And, you know, I got a little bit of heartburn. I'll just get some medicines for it. Right. And I think it's very important that people are evaluated. Like I said, it's one of our biggest risk factors for esophageal cancer. And there are other consequences that go along with reflux. And so I think it's important that you see your gastroenterologist, that upper endoscopy is performed. We look at the esophagus. We make sure that there's no true damage, because even with the medication, damage can continue. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it gets to be too late before we find it. And so surveillance is important. 
Um, we don't just jump to surgery. Somebody comes in and says, you know what? I heard about this operation. I've never tried medication. I haven't tried other options. I've never received before. I just want an operation. You know, we typically will work those patients up appropriately. Uh, they do need an upper endoscopy. Sometimes we use other anatomy type studies. We look at the function of the esophagus and we make an evaluation as to whether surgery is appropriate or do we start with medical treatment first and see if that is controlling things. And oftentimes that's a good answer. Um, mm -hmm. And from there we go with additional steps. So I think your answer to your question is yes, people should absolutely be evaluated if they're having ongoing symptoms. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any? I do, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, as my family has lived with, um, um, Many of them have heartburn, um, as well as my father actually um, had esophageal cancer. But one of the questions I had was in regards to ulcers, stomach ulcers. Is there any correlation between um, heartburn and ulcers at all? So um, there are various disease processes that increase the production of acid. So there's tumors like gastronomas or various disease processes where you can have an increased acid production and those predispose people to developing ulcers. And those patients will also oftentimes have reflux. But in the general population, it is usually two separate things. The ulcers and the things that we develop in our stomach like gastritis is a separate entity to that stuff making its way into the esophagus. And again, if the lower esophageal sphincter is working properly, it'll keep that entity in the stomach. And sometimes people struggle with ulcers and gastritis, but it's blocking the exposure of the esophagus. It's when that lower esophageal sphincter is no longer functioning the way that it should that allows that acid into the esophagus. So they really are two separate entities. Great, thank you. Another question that I had too, in regards to after having the surgery that you were speaking of, of how putting the stomach over on that area, is there any cause of reoccurrence like after, you know, after a certain period of time, if you go back to eating, your certain types of foods or anything to that nature, like spicy foods or anything like that? So it's a good question. And, and one of our goals with surgery is to help liberate people from, from the restrictions they've had on their diet and give them a little more freedom to be able to go back to enjoying things that they want. So I don't particularly limit patients' diets after the operation. We'll tell people to moderate, you know, don't drink 16 cups of coffee a day and don't overeat all the time. And, you know, still some anti-reflux precautions, don't eat a big meal and go to sleep five minutes later, those kinds of things. But uh, for the most part, uh, most people have very good long-term resolution. There is about a 5 to 7% failure rate with fund application long-term, meaning that you can see some recurrent reflux. Um, and in patients with hiatal hernias, depending on the size of the hernia, very, very large hernias sometimes have a reasonable recurrence rate. They can come back as many as 25 to 30% of the time. Standard hiatal hernias that are relatively small, that are fixed easily, the recurrence rates are much, much smaller than that. So... Um, you know, it's in excess of 90% of patients that will do very well long-term without recurrent symptoms. I do have one um, more question. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, um, so I'm going to ask one last question and I'll turn it over to Juliet. Um, so is it possible that, or do you have patients who, you know, have a, a Barrett's esophagus or something that is to the point where they're not a candidate, they, they're too far gone for surgery? Right. Or, or was that one of your... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, the answer to your question is yes. It's an unusual circumstance. Okay. Barrett's is not a contraindication okay. to surgery. It's actually one of the, the strongest indications for surgery. There have been some papers looking at patients that have Barrett's that are on medications versus surgery. And it was only the surgery arm that showed regression of the Barrett's. That medications, while they quiet the acids, still that exposure of stomach content in the esophagus doesn't allow the Barrett's to heal. Um, there are cases where Barrett's a little more um, uh, progressed, where we may ask one of the gastroenterologists to do um, a procedure, a radiofrequency ablation of the Barrett's to get rid of the Barrett's, and then we do a fund application to prevent the continued exposure, but Barrett's is not a contraindication. Okay. Now, if someone had an esophageal cancer, if they had Barrett's um, and on the biopsies or on the evaluation was shown to have some form of an esophageal cancer, then that is a contraindication okay. to surgery, to, sorry, to a fund application and that patient needs more aggressive treatment. Um, if someone has had reflux for a very long time and their esophagus is what we call burnt out, where it's not really functional anymore, mm -hmm. uh, those patients are not a candidate for surgery. So there are a few unusual circumstances, but that's the very, very few and far between. 
So what would be the indication of someone who's, because I've had um, heartburn for so long, I've um, many years now, and I constantly am taking um, I'm a praise alone. Mm-hmm. And um, even doing to the GI is basically telling me I can, I can never get off it, but not that he has done a and and you know and anything in this an endoscopy to see if I have Barrett's or you know anything that has progressed. So I was wondering, like at this point, you know, I'm kind of now I'm getting a little worried <laughs> if that's something that would not work for me, being that if I've been on this for so long that I've probably no longer. So, um, you, you know, yours is a very, very classic story. And the fact that you've been on medication for a long time does not uh, preclude you from being a candidate for surgery. Um, okay. um, there, there is, um, um, it's not an unusual picture that we have patients that come in and they've been dealing with a reflux for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years. And their GI doctor just continues to put them on medications. And, you know, somehow they hear about these potential surgical options and they come in and, 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 you know, we offer surgery. So, um, just because you've had um, 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 acid exposure or reflux for a very long time does not preclude you from being a candidate for surgery. When I talk about someone that has a burnt out esophagus, you know, that's someone with a, a, a dysfunctional esophagus. The acid has caused dysfunction, and that doesn't happen all the time. Like I said, that's very, very rare circumstance. And the vast okay. majority of people just kind of linger on with their reflux until they find us and find a definitive treatment. And then we can help them get off their medicines. Okay, so my first step would be to contact the GI and have him request a, and one of the um, and the, an endoscopy. E- and either then... either way, uh, I do a lot of endoscopies and in patients that are struggling to get things done um, on the traditional route. If they come to see us first, I'll be happy to do that for them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you have a good relationship with your gastroenterologist, then they're they're able to do that for you. That's another route for getting started with the process. Yeah, I went the last time I saw him. Um, that was one of the indication because I was telling him I really am getting worried about that it has increased in intensity and you sure. know at least you know I, sometimes I could go a couple of days without taking the medication, but now it has gotten to the point where I can't you know maybe a day and then I have to take it again. So, sure. cause I've been trying to get off it. And then I worry about all the other effects that like you, you discuss um, osteoporosis and everything. And he just indicated, well, you're gonna have to stay on it. So, you know, with I, some of the new literature that came out with these medications, a lot of people have become hesitant with the idea of just put you on a proton pump inhibitor and leave you on it for the rest of your life. And that's kind of why yeah. we swung back to some surgical options. And so right. I, I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss with you, this with you in, a, in, in an appointment and, and, you know, doing an endoscopy is something we can work on. So there are certainly some options. If you like to come in, by all means, just give us a call. Okay. And we'll a awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I, I really, again, appreciate yes. the time and I appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the office. Awesome. Yes, thank we you. appreciate you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Cohen, and thank you for joining us. Have a great night. You too. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. You again. Everyone have a nice night. Yes, thank you. All right. Bye-bye.